Julian, welcome. It's been reported that WikiLeaks, your baby, has, um, in the last few years, has released more classified documents than the rest of the world's media combined. C can that possibly be true? Yeah, can it possibly be true? It's a worry, isn't it, that the rest of the world's media is doing such a bad job that a little group of activists is able to release more of that type of information than the rest of the world press combined. How, how does it work? How, how, do you, how do people release the documents and how do you secure their privacy? Well, so these are, as far as we can tell, classical whistleblowers. And we have a number of ways for them to get information to us. So we use this state-of-the-art encryption to bounce stuff around the internet to hide trails, pass it through legal jurisdictions like Sweden and Belgium uh, to take, to enact those legal protections um, we get information in the mail, the regular postal mail, um, encrypted or not, uh, vet it like a regular news organization, format it, which is something, sometimes something that's quite hard to do when you're talking about giant databases of information, uh, release it to the public, and then uh, defend ourselves against the inevitable legal and political attacks. So you make an effort to ensure the documents are legitimate, but you, you actually almost never know who the identity of the source is. That's right. Is. Yeah, very, very rarely uh, do we ever know. And um, if we find out at some stage, then we destroy that information as soon as possible. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think that's the CIA asking what the code is for a TED membership. Uh, um, uh, um, so let's, uh, let's take an example, actually. This is, this is, something, this is something you um, leaked a few years ago, if we can have this document up. So this was a story in Kenya a few years ago. Can you tell us what, what you leaked and what happened? So this is the Kroll Report. This was a secret intelligence report commissioned by the Kenyan government um, after its election in 2004. Prior to 2004, Kenya was ruled by Daniel Arap Moy for about 18 years. He was a soft dictator of Kenya. And when Kibaki got into power through a coalition of forces who were trying to clean up corruption in Kenya, they commissioned this report, spent about two million pounds on this and associated report. And then the government sat on it uh, and used it for political leverage over Moy, who was the richest man, uh, still is the richest man in Kenya. It's the holy grail of Kenyan journalism. Uh, so I went there in uh, 2007 and we managed to get hold of this just prior to the election, uh, the national election, December 28. When we released that report, we did so three days after the new president, Kabaki, had decided to pal up with the man that he was going to clean out, Daniel Arab Moy. Um, so this report then <clears throat> became a dead albatross around uh, President Kabaki's neck. And, and I mean, to cut a long story short, word of the report leaked into Kenya, not from the official media, but indirectly, and, and, in, and in your opinion, it actually shifted the election. Yeah, so this became front page of The Guardian and was then printed uh, in all the surrounding countries of Kenya, in Tanzania and uh, South African press. And so it came in from the outside, and that, after a couple of days, made the Kenyan press feel safe to talk about it, and it ran for 20 nights straight on Kenyan TV shifted the vote uh, by 10%, according to a Kenyan intelligence report, uh, which changed the result of the election. Wow. So your leak um, really substantially changed the world. Yep. Uh, here's, um, we're going to just show um, a, a short clip from this um, Baghdad airstrike video. The video itself is longer, but, but here's a short clip. This is, um, this is intense material, I should warn you. Once you get on, just open on. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, um, uh, I see your element. You got uh, about four Humvees uh, right along this. Uh, You're clear. All right, firing. Line here. With the space line. Uh, let me know when you have it. What shoot? Light them all up. Come on, fire. Hey, Roger. Keep shoot. Keep shoot. Two things. Push the two things. We need to move 
time now. All right, we just engaged all eight individuals. Now we have two Americans. We're still firing. Roger. Got him. So, what was the impact of that? The impact on the people who worked on it was uh, severe. Uh, we ended up sending two people to Baghdad to further research that story. So this is just the first uh, of three attacks that occur uh, in that so, scene. I mean, 11 people died in that attack, right? Including two Reuters employees. Yeah, eight, eight, two Reuters employees, two young children uh, were wounded. There were between 18 and 26 people killed altogether. And releasing this caused widespread outrage. W what was the key element of this that actually caused the outrage, do you think? I don't know. I, I guess people can see the gross disparity uh, in force. You have a guy walking in a relaxed way down the street, and then a Apache helicopter sitting up at a one kilometre firing 30 millimetre cannon shells on everyone, um, looking for any excuse uh, to do so, uh, and killing people, rescuing the wounded. And there was two journalists involved who clearly weren't insurgents because that's their full-time job. I mean, there's been this um, U.S. intelligence analyst, um, Bradley Manning, arrested, and uh, it's, it's alleged that he confessed in a chat room to have leaked this video to you, uh, along with 280,000 classified U.S. embassy cables. I mean, did he? Well, we, we have denied receiving those cables. He has been charged about five days ago uh, with obtaining 150,000 cables and releasing 50. Uh, we have released <coughs> early in the year um, a cable from the Reykjavik U.S. Embassy, uh, but this is not necessarily connected. I mean, I, I was a known visitor of that embassy. I mean, if you, if you did receive thousands of, of U.S. Embassy diplomatic cables... We would have released them. Yeah. You would? Yeah. Because? Well, because these sort of things reveal uh, what the true state uh, of... Um, say, Arab governments alike, the true human rights abuses are in those governments. If you look at declassified cables, uh, that's the sort of material that's there. So, so let's talk a little more broadly about this. I mean, in general, what's your philosophy? Why is it right to encourage leaking of secret information? Yeah, well, there's a question as to what sort of information is important in the world. What sort of information can achieve uh, reform? And there's a lot of information. So, information that organizations are spending economic effort into concealing, uh, that's a really good signal uh, that when the information gets out, there's a hope of it doing some good. Because the organizations that know it best, that know it from the inside out, are spending work to conceal it. Um, and that's what we've found in practice, and that's what uh, the history of journalism is. But are there risks with that, um, either to the individuals concerned, or, or indeed to uh, society at large where leaking can actually have an unintended consequence? Yeah, not that we've seen anything we've released. I mean, we have a harm minimization policy. We have a way of, of dealing with information that has sort of personal, uh, personally identifying information in it. But um, there are legitimate secrets. Uh, you know, your records with your doctor, that's a legitimate secret. Um, but we deal with whistleblowers that are coming forward that are really sort of well-motivated. So, so they are well motivated, and what would you say to, for example, the, um, you know, the parent of, of someone whose son is, is out serving the US military, and he says, you know what, you, you've put up something that someone had an incentive to put out, it shows a US soldier laughing at, the, at people dying. You know, that gives the impression, has given the impression to millions of people around the world that US soldiers are inhuman people. Actually they're not, my son isn't, how dare you? What would you say to that? Yeah, we do get a lot of that. Um, but remember, the people in Baghdad, the people in Iraq, the people in Afghanistan, they don't need to see the video. Uh, they see it every day. So it's not going to change their opinion. It's not going to change their perception. That's what they see every day. Um, it will change the perception and opinion uh, of the people who are paying for it all. Um, and that's our hope. So you found a way to shine light into um, what you see as these sort of dark secrets in, in companies and, and in government. Um, light is good, um, but is, do you see any irony in the fact that in order for you to shine that light, you have to yourself create secrecy 
around your sources? Not really. I mean, uh, we don't have any WikiLeaks dissidents yet. Um, we don't have sources who are dissidents on other sources. Um, uh, should they come forward, I mean, that will be a tricky situation for us, but um, we are presumably acting in such a way that uh, people feel uh, morally compelled uh, to continue our mission, not to, uh, not to screw it up. I'd actually be, be interested, just based on what we've, we've heard so far, just to get a... I'm, I'm curious as to the opinion in the TED audience, and um, it, you know, there, there might be a couple of views of WikiLeaks and of, of Julian. You know, hero, people's hero, bringing this important light, dangerous troublemaker. Who's, for the, who's, who's got the hero view? Who's got the dangerous troublemaker view? Well, it's oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a soft crowd, Gillian, a soft crowd. We have to try better. Let's show them a, another example. Now, here's, here's something that you haven't yet, you haven't yet leaked, but I think, I think for Ted, you are. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an intriguing story that's just happened, right? Yeah. What is this? So this is like a sample of what we do sort of every day. So late last year, in November last year, there was a series of well blowouts in Albania, um, like the well blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, but not quite as big. Um, and we got a report, um, a sort of engineering analysis into what happened, uh, saying that in fact security guards um, from some rival various competing oil firms uh, had in fact parked trucks there and blown them up. Uh, and the Albanian, Albanian part of the Albanian government was in this, et cetera, et cetera. And the engineering report had nothing on the top of it. So it was an extremely difficult document for us. We couldn't verify it because we didn't know who wrote it and knew what it was about. So we were kind of skeptical that maybe it was a, com a competing oil firm just sort of playing the issue up. So under that basis, we put it out and said, look, we're skeptical about this thing. We don't know, but what can we do? It, the material looks good, it feels right, but we just can't verify it. And we then got a letter uh, just this week um, from the company who wrote it, wanting to track down the source. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, saying, um, hey, we want to track down the source, and we were like, oh, tell us more. What document is it precisely you're talking about? Can can you show that you had legal authority over that document? Is it really yours? So they sent us um, this screenshot <laughs> with the author in the like Microsoft Word ID. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Um, that's happened quite a lot, though. This is like one of our methods of, of identifying, uh, verifying what material is, is to try and get these guys to write letters. Yeah. H have you had um, information from inside BP? Yeah, we, we have a lot. But, uh, I mean, at the moment, we are undergoing a sort of serious fundraising and engineering effort. So our, our publication rate is, um, over the past few months, has been sort of minimized by we're re-engineering uh, our back systems for the of phenomenal public interest that we have. Um, that's a problem. I mean, like any sort of growing startup organization, uh, we are sort of overwhelmed by uh, our growth, uh, and that means we're getting enormous quantity of whistleblower disclosures of a very high caliber, uh, but don't have enough people to actually uh, process and vet this information. So that's the, that's the key bottleneck, basically journalistic volunteers and, and or the funding of journalistic salaries. Yep. Yeah, right. and trusted people. I mean, we're an organization that is hard to grow very quickly uh, because of the sort of material we, we deal with. So we have to restructure in order to um, uh, have people who would deal with the higher sec national security stuff and then less lower security cases. So help us understand a bit more about you personally and how you came to do this. And I think I read that as a, as a kid, you went to 37 different schools. Can that be right? You know, I, Parents were in the movie business and uh, then uh, on the run from a cult. So the combination between the two. <laughs> I mean, a, a psychologist might say that's a recipe for breeding paranoia. Uh, uh, what, well, the movie business? And you were also a hacker at an uh, early age and ran into the authorities early on. Um, well, I was, a, I was a journalist 
you know, I was a very young journalist activist in an early age. I wrote a magazine uh, and was prosecuted for it in my, when I was a teenager. Um, so ha you have to be careful with hacker. I mean, this is like, this is a method that can be deployed for various things. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's mostly deployed by the Russian mafia in order to steal your grandmother's bank accounts. So, so this phrase is, is not, uh, not as nice as it used to be. Yeah, well, I certainly don't think you're stealing anyone's um, grandmother's bank account. Um, but what about, I mean, your core values? Can you give us a sense of what they are and maybe some incident in your life that helped determine them? I'm not sure about the incident, but the uh, core values, um, well, capable, generous men do not create victims, they nurture victims. Um, and that's something from my father and something from other capable, generous men uh, that has been in my life. Capable, generous men do not create victims, they nurture victims. Yeah, and um, it, you know, I'm a combative person. So I'm not actually so big on the nurture, but so, some way, <laughs> there, there is a way of, another way of nurturing victims, which is to police perpetrators uh, of crime. And so that is um, something that has in, been in my character uh, for a long time. So just tell us very quickly in the last minute that, that's remained, what, what happened in Iceland? Um, you, ran, you basically published something there, got run into trouble with the bank, um, the, the news service there was injuncted from running the story. Instead, they publicized your site. That made you very high profile in Iceland. What happened next? Yeah, so this is a, a great case. You know, Iceland went through this financial crisis. It was the hardest hit of any country in the world. Its banking sector was 10 times the GDP of the rest of the economy. Um, anyway, so we re released this report in, in July uh, last year, and the national TV station was injuncted five minutes before it went on air, like out of a movie, injunction landed on the news desk and the newsreader was like, this has never happened before, what do we do? Well, we just show the website instead for all that time as a filler. Um, and we became very famous in Iceland, went to Iceland and spoke about this issue. And there was a feeling in the community uh, that that should never happen again. And as a result, uh, working with Icelandic politicians and some other international legal experts, we put together a new sort of package of legislation for Iceland to sort of become an, an offshore haven for the free press uh, with the strongest journalistic protections in the world with a new Nobel Prize for freedom of speech. Iceland's a Nordic country so like Norway it's able to tap into the system and just a, f a month ago this was passed by the Icelandic parliament uh, unanimously. Wow. So, last, last question, Jim. When you, when you think of the future then, do you think it's more likely to be Big Brother exerting more control, more secrecy, or us watching Big Brother, or it's just all to be played for either way? I'm not sure which way it's going to go. I mean, there's enormous pressures to harmonize uh, freedom of speech legislation and transparency legislation around the world, the, within the EU, between China, the United States, which way is it going to go? It's hard to see. Uh, that's why it's a very interesting time to be in, because with just a little bit of effort, we can shift it uh, one way or the other. Well, it looks like I'm reflecting the audience's opinion to say, Julian, um, be careful and all power to you. Thank you. Chris. Thank you.